Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Inside American Politics talk tonight on views of the US election from abroad. Our two guests tonight, or three guests now, are Dr. Roberto Dalimonte, a lecturer on Italian politics here at New York University, Florence, and professor of political science at the Luis University in Rome, and Nicole Baccarin, a French political analyst. They're, they will be in conversation with our own director of NYU Florence, Ellen Toscano, who knows American politics very well, having worked for many years in the US Congress. Uh, Professor Dalimonte's primary interests are electoral systems, elections, and voting behavior in Italy. He has also advised the government of Matteo Renzi on matters concerning the upcoming referendum on Italian constitutional reform. Ms. Baccarin was a national fellow at the Hoover Institute, a political think tank at Stanford between 2013 and 2014. She has written extensively on American and French politics and society. In 2007, Ms. Baccarin was awarded the Legion of Honor by the President of the French Republic, Nicolas Sarkozy. And she has given many interviews and been a regular contributor on both French and American news outlets, including TF1 and the New York Times on transatlantic relations and international politics. I would also like to let the students here know that starting tomorrow, we will be having an American election film series uh, taking place in the Blue Room at Villa Natalia from 8 to 10 p.m. This week, the film is The War Room, a documentary on Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign. And without further ado, uh, and a special thanks to Professor Dallamonte for joining us um, and taking the place of Maurizio Molinari, um, the director of La Stampa, who had to cancel at the last minute. Unfortunately, he had a conflicting engagement in Torino. So, thank you. Um, maybe because Roberto joined us late, we'll start with you, uh, Nicole, and have a brief French or international perspective of our very interesting and provocative and somewhat frightening election. Hello, it's good to be here and, and good to see some friends I hadn't seen in a long time. And that makes it very special, so thank you for having me. Uh, from a French view, I mean, observing this election, I can tell you that it provokes in, intense interest, uh, shock, something close to sideration, and the usual frustration about not being allowed to vote. I mean, it's like everybody thinks they should have a say. And this year, as usual. And there are two ways that the French really sort of identify this, with this election. I mean, there is the usual, you know, questioning about what's going to happen with the world. Uh, what is the, uh, the American foreign policy going to be? And uh, obviously Hillary Clinton is perceived as a continuity uh, after Barack Obama. She, she's known to be kind of tougher, more, more than hawk, but you know, a good friend of Europe, um, a good friend of Israel, um, someone who would be a good partner in, in the uh, current alliances, especially NATO. I mean, there is nothing worrisome for most French people about Hillary Clinton being elected. Donald Trump obviously is quite another story and there is a feeling I think shared around the world that nothing is stable, nothing is sure. Um, you know, he, he said things like NATO was obsolete and it needed to be reorganized entirely. He mentioned that the US would not protect uh, countries like maybe the Baltic states, uh, if they needed to be protected and they hadn't paid enough uh, for their own uh, defense. We've seen that he's, he wants to be at least good friends with Vladimir Putin, that he called on Russia to keep hacking <laughs> um, pri private servers of people he doesn't like, like Hillary Clinton. Uh, about the Middle East, I mean, it's all very vague, except uh, an announcement that he will eradicate the Islamic State within 30 days. So you just wonder <laughs> where the plan is, where the method is, how we would want to do that. Uh, start a trade war with China, encourage South Korea and Japan to acquire their own nuclear weapons. I mean, it's, I mean his reading of the world kind of scares almost everybody except people who have an interest in seeing chaos one way or the other. But, you know, the probability of Donald Trump being elected is getting smaller uh, every day. So beyond those issues that touch Europe, the French, uh, about foreign policies, I think the big issue is about the future of our democracy. I mean, everybody is wondering how come Donald Trump is the nominee 
of the Republican Party. What, what's going on? And how far what's happened in the US is going on in other countries, and what does it tell us about the, about the future? I mean, the United States being the oldest, biggest uh, democracy of the world, you know, we kind of all look up to it and what's going to happen next to us, all of us. And um, France is known often as being the bluest of the blue states because there is such a strong rooting for the uh, Democratic Party. And it's true that a large majority of the French hope that Hillary Clinton uh, will be elected. People have a hard time understanding from far away why is she so disliked? Well, why is she so hated? I mean, you know, the, the problems that she has, the issues of mistrust are not really understood from far away. Um, I can tell as well that the leaders of the traditional parties, I would say in France, you know, the, the Socialist Party, the Social Democrats, the more conservative parties, they are really hoping that she'll be elected beyond the issues that I mentioned before, because if she is elected, when there is a candidate that so much represents rejection of the elites, well, they might survive. <laughs> I mean, it's not over. I mean, you know, after the Brexit, that nobody really saw coming, uh, somebody like Donald Trump rising even just to the level of a major candidate scares all the leaders of traditional parties because they, they feel, and I think there is a movement towards some populism that opens gates to we don't know exactly exactly what. Uh, but I, uh, I, I'll, I'll be very brief to conclude, but it, it would be unfair and inaccurate to say that all of France hopes for Hillary Clinton to win. As you know, we have uh, an extreme right party, uh, the National Front, that has polls around 30, 35 percent. It's very high, and that's where you find people rooting for Donald Trump, as well as on the extreme left. You know, they, they might have been surprised by, let's say, Donald Trump's looks and style. Uh, the, the National Front in France, people have a more traditional uh, appearance and a more traditional way of talking about politics, but deep down, there is a lot of thing in common, you know, the hostility towards towards foreigners, uh, hostility towards immigration, hostility towards globalization, towards trade deals, uh, wanting to strengthen the borders, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, deep down, basically, they are very close beyond differences of um, of style, and you know, I do a lot of media work in France those days. And it's very clear, and I say it up front, I do hope that Hillary Clinton will be elected. I don't feel any need to hide it because this is not a regular election year between two fairly decent candidates. I mean, it's a different moment in, in, in history, but I get masses of email of people saying, oh, you don't understand. Oh, of course, the Americans, you know. Uh, why would you look down on someone who is a very successful businessman, et cetera, et cetera. And it all has to do with the elite have contempt for the people. And that's very strong in France. And people who feel that way in France think Donald Trump should be elected. Not because they trust him or they trust his promises. I, I don't think they do. But when it comes down to their motivation, I think there is this idea that the elites should be punished. They've proved inefficient. Uh, people, regular people, don't benefit from globalization. They're left behind. And they have no voice. And it's time for them to express what they want. And in France, I think more than in the United States, probably, it comes down also to how they see uh, their relationship to Russia. Russia is very, very uh, central. Um, Marine Le Pen, who is the leader of the National Front, said, she didn't say, I support Donald Trump, she said anyone but Hillary Clinton, because Hillary Clinton is war. And that comes from the idea that you find on the far right and the far left in France that the United States is the dangerous power. Whereas people like me, what I see, what I think I understand is that Russia is waging kind of a 
Cold War on its own. Uh, I mean, you know, the Ukraine and Crimea and uh, devastatingly what's going on in Syria. Uh, and, and there is no partner in, 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 in that Cold War. And if there is any danger, it comes in Europe from Russia and certainly not from the United States. So those two issues, what relationship to the elite, what relationship to Russia, is what influences, I think, the French view of the um, of the US election. And so I would close with this before we hear from Professor Edolamonte. Basically, there is one choice. Uh, what do we do to improve our democracies? Because obviously there is a lot of frustration out there. Or do we just break it and see what happens? And basically, what's what people are going to decide upon? vote for Hillary Clinton with enthusiasm for some <laughs> kind of boredom from others, resignation, I don't know, but trying to find ways to improve what we have and trying to find something a little better. Or let's break it all and go down that road and see what happens. So no surprise, I'm for <laughs> trying to improve what we have, even if it's only slightly improving it. Well, I basically agree with everything that Nicole has said. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, what makes uh, Europe and America very similar these days is the level of dissatisfaction, frustration. Nicole used the word frustration. There is a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction with the present situation, the present the status quo, that a lot of people who are very angry. Uh, I've been told that using the word pissed off maybe is inappropriate. Is that right, Ellen? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> because I, I think I think is a word that expresses the best, if I understand it correctly, the mood that um, uh, is very widespread in the United States and in France and in Italy and in, other, and in Britain, uh, in the West, basically. There is a tremendous uh, level of anger. I think there was a cover of The Economist uh, a few weeks ago, the politics of anger. That was published after, I was an issue of The Economist after Brexit. And that's precisely what is happening, the politics of anger. People are angry. They want change. Uh, they do not really grasp precisely what change is, but they are, you know, they want something different. And so the question is, you know, why is this? You know, we, our societies are still pretty prosperous. True, there is in some countries there are unacceptable levels of unemployment and stuff, but not in the U.S., for example, because in the U.S is the US economy is running at almost full employment, basically. And yet, in spite of this, there is this ang anger that is so widespread. Why? Uh, I think it's connected to the uncertainty, fears. Fears, uh, uncertainty. People feel uncertain. Even people who are pretty well off, they feel uncertain about the future. And this uncertainty, these fears, is driven by things that, some of the things they grasp and others they don't grasp. Uh, globalization is certainly a source of anxiety, of uncertainty, of fears. And globalization is connected to immigration, is connected to the loss of jobs. But actually, what most people do not really understand that they, the real driver of change and the real source of uncertainty, more than globalization, is science and technology. It is the, the, the continuous revolution that we're going through uh, with the internet, with 3D printing. You know, we, we're be, just beginning to see the impact of 3D printing and, and the artificial intelligence. We're just beginning to see 
the impact of artificial in intelligence. Imagine that we're approaching a world where there will be no taxi drivers anymore. You know, there were no track stairs. Tracks will be driven by computers located who knows where. Look at the number of jobs that they're going to be lost. And there is a feeling that this is happening uh, and people are reacting to these kind of things that they barely grasp, but they, they feel that they are out there. And they react by protesting against the establishment, the elites. You know, and this is true in, in, in the US and it, it's true in, in Italy. And, and Trump, paradoxically, is seen as the anti-establishment guy. It is actually not. <laughs> And this is very similar to what Berlusconi did. Berlusconi came in the picture in politics in Italy in 1994, claiming to be the anti-establishment, which was deeply embedded into the establishment. And, and this is another thing that should be, we have a hard time to explain, you know. But this is what is happening with Trump. And I'm concerned, I am concerned, because, you know, maybe, Trump will not win, and I hope he doesn't win. And it seems that he's not going to win, even though, you know, you know American politics is full of surprises. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's a surprise himself. Uh, what has come out in the last few weeks it was a surprise negative for Trump. And I hope there will, not be, there will not be surprises that are going to come out in the next few weeks that are going to play against Hillary, but you never know. But even though, even though Trump, we hope, will lose, but still the phenomenon is out there, and uh, and is it's it's worrisome because I think we are not doing both in America and in Europe. We're not doing a good job in managing this transition uh, during this time of great economic change. Uh, established parties are not coping well with this transition. I want to give you an anecdote that really impressed me. Something that happened to me about a month ago. I took a taxi in Rome. I learned a lot of things like many people with, from taxi drivers. And this taxi driver was a 60 years old man, a little over 60s. And I asked him how long he had been a taxi driver. I want to talk to him. So I asked him how long he had been a taxi driver. And he told me that he had bought the taxi, the driver, the, you know, that you need the license, like in Paris, I believe, you know, to drive a taxi. He said that he had bought his license three years before. So I asked him, you know, what did you do before? And he told me, I work for Bulgari, you know Bulgari, that is Louis Vuitton, today is Louis Vuitton, the biggest luxury company in the world. He had worked for Bulgari for 30 years as a goldsmith. That is, as an artisan with skills dating back centuries, maybe, to the assets. You know, this, we think of this guy working gold. You know, with, One day he was called in by his human resources guy and he was fired along with other people in his lab because now a 3D printer is doing this thing, his, his job, 3D printer. What do you think this guy, the feeling this guy had? He was pissed off, he was angry. Now, in, in, in the US, he would vote for Trump. Guess who he's voting for in Italy? For Beppe Grillo, for the comedian, because, you know, there's a Trump phenomenon. You know, the comparison today, you know, I, I, am, I told Ellen, I'm, in the last few days, I've been called from Washington, New York, from the Washington Post, the New York Times, and they asked me about Trump and Berlusconi. But really today, the, compare, the better comparison is Trump and Grillo, not Trump and Berlusconi. The American press is on the wrong track in trying to understand. Because there is there are some analogies between Trump and Berlusconi. But the real analogies today, given what we discussed, what we said before, Nicole and I, is between Trump and, uh, and the Five Star Movement. But I want to stop here. Then maybe we can talk about Trump and Berlusconi later.
Maybe we can stay on the globalization um, pissed offness of uh, the electorate around the world. We did a conference last week on Brexit. Um, there again, whatever the undercurrent of populism that existed in the UK, the pundits, politicians, pollsters didn't really pick it up. Um, and I think most people were surprised by the outcome of Brexit. It too was this undercurrent of dissatisfaction with globalization, this feeling that though globalization was in general a good thing, it benefited some, but most people were losers. And the number of people who benefited from globalization was very small, the famous 1% versus the rest, the 99%. Why are we having so much trouble understanding, polling, um, perceiving this political undercurrent, which is um, continuing strangely to surprise us? Why are we with a Trump Republican candidacy when nobody in the political conference that we have every year, not one of the major political consultants could predict that Donald Trump would be the Republican candidate. He's a surprise to everybody. Why, if we understand this level of dissatisfaction, is it invisible to us? What happened, what happened with uh, Donald Trump uh, happened also in Italy with Grillo. Those of you who are familiar with Italian politics remember that on February 2013, uh, we were, when the votes were counted, the last political elections in Italy, and the votes were counted, and Grillo turned out to be the largest party in Italy. Overnight, this is a party that never ran in a national election before, and on February 2013, it was the largest party in Italy. Even the performance of the Five Star Movement was better than that of Berlusconi in 1984. Berlusconi, you know, formed Go Italy uh, in early 1994, and he got 21% of the votes in March of 1994. Grillo got 25% of the votes, the largest party in the country. We didn't see it. Our, well, one thing is that our tools in, in it, poll, polling today is very flawed. You know, Fraud. no flawed. Flawed, right. flawed, flawed, flawed. I mean, polling is that unreliable. That is, it's not good. <laughs> not good. <laughs> okay. It's unreliable, and, and and that's one reason we didn't see it because. But, but polling is very good in the United States. It's an but it's it a science. But it and yet, polling is not did wasn't picking up the the Trump. That victory. is not good. Yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> if you know, you know, polling, to, if, if polling doesn't pick up, you know, the, the, the trends, you know, the question is why? You know, why? What has happened? Now, for example, are, the, are these new voters? In my opinion, they're new voters, but they also they, there are some methodological challenges now with polling. And one, for example, certainly in Italy, is the fact that in the old days, polling was easy. Why? Because there were phone lines, fixed no, lane lines, and you do you would do your sample. You know, you need a sample, you know, for polling. You do your sample with lane lines, and the sample was uh, a good one. It was a representative sample of the population. So it was easy to do the sample in number one. And so polling was more reliable because it was easier to do sampling. The other thing is that party identification was much stronger in those days. And so that was another indicator that would help polling. Today, with lane lines gone, gone, you need to do sampling using cell phone, which is much more difficult technically. Mixing lane lines and cell phone. But now even cell phone is not enough. You have to including the sampling, also the internet. Because there are young voters, you know, that you can reach only with the internet, not even with cell phone. So technically, it has become more difficult. And if you add on top of this, the volatility now of uh, 
public opinion, you know. And then I think this is this mix is what uh, has become a huge challenge. And there are a lot of people in the in in uh, well, I stop here. Yeah, I mean, I remember the week, or yeah, the week uh, Donald Trump grabbed the nomination. I mean, the American press and universities and think tanks. I mean, uh, we were all about what happened. What is it? What we missed? And basically, nobody believed this was going to happen to the last minute, almost. I mean, obviously, the last days. But what is it that we don't pick up on? And, and, and that's a real issue. And I think it might be different in some European countries in, in the US because I think one of the factors that hid that possibility in the United States is that the, there is no rational for such a level of anger. As Roberto mentioned, you know, we are close, you're close to full employment, even if we know that a lot of people dropped out of any kind of statistics and list, and that uh, there are some, a few million people who are not looking for a job, are not working. So it's, the statistics of full employment is not accurate. But still, I mean, you know, Overall, the situation really has improved, whereas where you in France, massive unemployment is the issue upon which any kind of populist leader can build about, you know, down with the immigration, down with the refugees, down with the elites, etc. because elites haven't figured out a way to improve the, to improve the job market. But since this anger is shared in a country like France and in a country like the United States, um, one of the things to wonder about is edu education. I mean, the level of education are very stratified in all our, all our countries. And there are obviously a lot of people that don't get a decent education and are, are very vulnerable to those technological changes that Roberto mentioned, like all those conspiracy theory on the internet that are as good as hard science if you talk to a lot of people. So obviously that's one of the challenges that uh, we haven't figured out how to deal with. How do we uh, spread hard facts, science, proper education in an era when it's so many people derive satisfaction from thinking, oh, they know better, and you know, <laughs> something is hidden from us, but we'll figure it out. I mean, it's, it, it's one of the issues. I mean, when you, you look at the polls that has flawed as they might be about Donald Trump voters, they don't even believe his, his promises. It doesn't matter. I mean, facts don't matter. Uh, promises don't matter. Responsibility doesn't matter. What matters is basically to say no and, and, and punish this establishment that nobody knows exactly what it is. And so I am thinking about education as one of the keys. I'm thinking as well about this terrible notion of populism and, and, and people. There are lots of books in France coming out uh, these weeks, actually, from various people representing the extreme right, the very, very conservative right. And it's all about we speak for the people. And as soon as people f speak for the people, that means there is a common understanding that nobody bothers defining what is the people and who, who deserves to belong to it. And I'm like, okay, so the people are basically people who have a hard time, a low income, a little education, but they dream to send their kids to university. So if they send a child to university, they, they're not the people anymore. And if their kid get a degree, but push them to, towards the elite. I mean, it's a very, very, very scary concept, but basically it tells you who you are entitled to hate. Uh, I, I mean, honestly, it sounds like pitchforks and torches, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah, I think there is a lot of work to do to better figure out what the anger is about, how widespread it is, how, how much, what kind of tools we have to fight it, but as well, what are the political responsibilities? Because Donald Trump is a unique individual, but he comes from a long strategy among a certain part of the Republican Party. He could not have been 
the candidate if for a few decades they weren't, especially during the primaries, you know, candidates that would, would have gone down the road of old America, back to the past, uh, religion first, uh, foreigners can't assimilate, and deep down, I mean, I heard that from people who are well off in the US, very well educated, and still think that there is something very wrong if you have a black president. So, I mean, Donald Trump is just like the tip of the iceberg of what happened, and where anger was nurtured by a part of the political class. To maybe close out the conversation about polls, um, yesterday with the, there was a poll reported, Washington Post ABC News poll, that notwithstanding all of the recent revelations, including a videotape, Hillary Clinton holds a four-point lead over Donald Trump. Four po points of likely voters. So it is a 47 to 43 percent split. So, Nicole, you're right. There is some, um, as um, one of the participants in the Brexit conference said, we are in a post-truth era. It's irrelevant what we know about him or even what we know about her. It is, there is this undercurrent of fear and hatred and xenophobia. We haven't talked about migration, which is a kind of another current that connects the United States and Europe. The fear of their of loss of some part of the population feeling loss of control over their own borders, this concept, this old concept of sovereignty which feels challenged by globalization. We talked about globalization in terms of um, the economic inequalities or disparities, but um, at least as prevalent uh, an anxiety, which may be being expressed, certainly was expressed in Brexit, is this push of migration. Yeah, it's paradoxical because there in the United States, it seems to me migration is, in, in actual terms... It was one of the founding myths. First of all, but now, if I read correctly the data, there is no such a huge uh, influx of Mexicans into the US. The issue is the Mexicans who are the millions of people who are there without papers, without documents, 11 million people. You know, it's not the new people, it's the people already there. Uh, what is extraordinary is how can even people who vote for Trump think that these 11 million people can be deported out to the United States. I mean, Post -truth. It's, it's mind boggling, you know, just to, and it, there is not an issue now of people coming in. I, I believe somebody told me even that, I'm not an expert on these things, but there are not more Mexicans that go back to Mexico <laughs> rather than Mexicans who came, come to the US. So the real issue is those who are already there and they cannot be deported, really. I mean, this, but but you know, in the case of the United States, however, I think that there is also a Hillary factor, which you mentioned before. There's not simply the pissed off factor, the first, the, the the anger, the frustration, the mistrust, the fear, anxiety. There's also a Hillary factor. There are people who cannot bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton. They hate Hillary Clinton so much, even educated people. I have some educated friends who tell me, you know, I can't vote for Hillary. I prefer to vote for Trump rather than see Hillary president. And this is a specific American factor that, you know, I do not understand. Yeah, Nicole, you said earlier that the French can't understand Hillary's unpopularity. You How have much to explain it to us. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I'll ask a question to have you. How, how much, what do you think is the role of gender in her lack of popularity? I, I do think that gender plays a very, very heavy part. And not only about the election, the moment where the issue is, you know, is she strong enough? Is she healthy enough? Is she tough enough? Or can she be 
uh, you know, the, um, the commander in chief of the strongest army in the world. I think the idea that war is a, a business for men and not women, it's still there. And you have uh, leaders, female leaders, in, in Scandinavia, in Iceland, in, in Germany, uh, all sorts of situations. First of all, where the education is very strong, but where the army is not very strong. I mean, it's, the very international role of the army has no, is nothing to be, to be compared. But we, we've, with Dominique, my husband, who is right here, we've written this book about first ladies, and we've followed their careers, and we've obviously closely followed Hillary Clinton's career, and it's very interesting. She was very popular every single time she was sort of a traditional wife and mother. When she moved to Arkansas with Bill Clinton, and he was elected governor, and she was like his first advisor in charge of education and health. She was still called uh, Hillary Rodham. She wore glasses. She didn't act, you know, the hostess. She was hated. She figured it out. She changed her looks. She, you know, had this little girl on her hip, and she took. She talked about family issues and and gentler issues. And she was elected or voted, I don't know, by some magazine, uh, Woman of the Year, Mother of the Year. They loved her in Arkansas. She moved to Washington. Uh, election 1992. Bill Clinton came forward with this uh, two for the price of one. She was hated and in charge of the failed effort uh, towards um, the healthcare reform. She was accused of murder, drug trafficking, pornography, you name it. Called, of course, Lady Macbeth. I mean, you know, the, the witch, basically. I mean, it draws on very, very old cliches. And, and the second part of uh, Bill Clinton's presidency, she traveled around, she talked about, you know, girls' rights, children's rights, and people loved her. Lewinsky scandal. She was like the wife who stays by her man, uh, saved the marriage, saved the family. She was like 80% popular. When she ran for the Senate, she was elected very well in New York, but nationwide she, was, she dropped at 45% popularity. Obviously in 2008 she failed. She became Secretary of State, so she was under the orders uh, uh, of a man, of President Obama, and she was very popular. I mean, she was in the upper 60s. She runs for president, she drops immediately between 40 and 50. I mean, the gender issue doesn't explain it all, but this woman who is aging, who wants the power for herself, who is so ambitious, I don't think any of those three traits would be seen as a flaw in a man. I mean, we take it for granted, but if you want to be president of the United States, you have a super ego, <laughs> and you are extremely ambitious, and you love power. But in a female, it's obviously more disturbing. Well, I see. Well, for the me, irony for is, me, it's still a mystery. We have this. honesty as a kind of theme in the debate in the election. Um, Hillary's dishonesty, right? And yet we have someone who, all the political and newspapers, news organizations are fact-checking everything both of them say, and it's kind of scientific that most of what Donald Trump says um, strains credulity, and yet that isn't a liability for him. So there is a sort of, truth plays um, an, an, a strange role in this campaign. It, it's relevant in one case and not in the other, or honesty. In that case, we have to look for some other explanation. So Nicole, you talked about 30 to 35% um, are in the extreme right in, in France. How do they see their interests aligned with a Donald Trump? You know, I might not have followed all the opinions by political leaders around the world about Donald Trump, but what I remember is that who said they were rooting for Donald Trump? The National Front in France, uh, Vladimir Putin for obvious reasons, uh, North Korea, uh, the Islamic State, 
which at some point had some um, uh, press communiques saying, oh, wonderful, it'd be chaos in America, that's what we need. And it doesn't go beyond that. I mean, it's really dreaded by the political class. So what kind of interests do they have? I mean, if it comes to Vladimir Putin, it's very obvious. I think there is this connection between alpha males and as well the fact that Donald Trump affirming how, how tough he's going to be lies down flat in front of anything that Vladimir Putin wants. I mean, Crimea, the Ukraine, you want to deal with the Middle East your way, <laughs> have it your way. And more or less, it's probably the same thing when with the National Front. I mean, they, they don't believe in, in democracy as we do. They don't believe in an alliance with the United States. They rather have an alliance with you know, a stronger powers, not stronger in terms of real strength, but uh, in, in terms of you know, uh, less democratic uh, state, much less democratic, as well as seen as more traditional, uh, potentially more religious, back to old Europe values, uh, less immigrants, no, no influence from Arabs, that's a big theme, uh, you know, less Islam, less Arabs, and, and, and back to Christianity as they, they think it should, it, it should be. So I guess there is this cultural and, and, and political proximity that links them one way or, or the other to what they see in Donald Trump. Well, the rent in Italy is, um, is um, smaller than the the, the extreme right in, in France. The extreme right in Italy is, uh, is made up of this Brothers of Italy, the party of Mrs. Meloni, and Salvini can be considered extreme right, the Lega Nord. But together they don't come up to the strength of uh, the Front National, and the reason being the Five Star Movement. The Five Star Movement is sif siphoning off voters from the right. Uh, and the Five Star Movement, what is interesting is the Five Star Movement position of Grillo's party, for example, on immigration, which is a typical uh, extreme right issue, is very ambiguous. They are not clearly against immigration because they're not an extreme right party, they're not a left party, they're a party that straddle across the political spectrum, they get their votes from everywhere, and, uh, and so. It makes the Italian picture different from the French picture. Uh, Ellen, can I ask Nicole a question? Which has nothing to do with the US, but I am so curious about the French situation since we're now speaking about France. Nicole, uh, let me tell the audience. At the end of November, there's going to be an important primary in France for the nomination of the candidate of the Republicans, the French Republicans. <laughs> And the two candidates, no, there are more than two candidates, but the two, yeah, there's seven candidates. But the two leading candidates are Juppé and Sarkozy. What's going to happen? <laughs> the common wisdom is if only militants of the Republicans, that's the name of the party now, vote, uh, it's going to be Sarkozy because he really holds. The, the party in, tight, in a tight grip. If it's wider, if more people go out to vote, like two millions, it's going to be Juppé, most definitely, because a lot of people who are not militant enough to be part of a party uh, think that Juppé has a much better chance. So they will want to push Juppé as a more centrist, moderate candidate, than, than Sarkozy. I mean, the rejection of Sarkozy is extremely strong. Let me just explain, first of all, to the audience, because may, maybe not everybody is familiar with the French picture. You know, at this point, it seems, you know, the, for the election of the president, in, in France, there is a, a runoff. There's a system with a runoff and the second ballot. And only two candidates go to the runoff. Uh, usually, it has been the candidate, usually, but not always, it has been the candidate of the Socialist Party, the candidate of the left, and the candidate of the right. 
And this time it seems that the candidate of the Socialist Party, which is going to be Hollande, I believe, right? It seems. <laughs> in, in the last interview, he, did, he, did, he was interviewed by the Nouvel Observateur, and he said, je suis prêt. So what does it mean? That, yeah. But in any case, whether it is Hollande or not, most likely uh, the two candidates in the runoff, but tell me if I'm correct, will be Marine Le Pen, extreme right, and a candidate of the Republicans party. And uh, it will either be Sarkozy or Juppé. Now, yesterday I got a phone call from the, a journalist of the Nouvel Observateur, and she told me she is leftist journalist, <laughs> Nouvel Observateur. <laughs> And she told me these things very interesting, and I'd, asked, I'd like to ask you, then we go back to American politics. <laughs> but I want to take advantage of... take the pressure off <laughs> no, I, I want to take advantage of the presence of Nicole. This woman told me that there is a movement uh, now in France for socialist sympathizer to register for the primary in the Republican Party so that it can have a voice in the selection on the choice between Juppé and Sarkozy and these people who are left, leftist voters registering in the, in the primary, they want Juppé to succeed because they don't want to face the choice which will be similar to the US, the choice between Sarkozy and Marine Le Pen because you understand that the, for, for a socialist voter, the choice between Sarkozy and Marine Le Pen <laughs> would, be, would be very painful, <laughs> like for many Americans, is the choice between Hillary and Trump. Do you see what I mean? Yes, and I, 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 I this... hear that too. I hear that too. And actually, from what we know, because we see really, honestly, anytime we have dinner with friends, that's the, that's the topic, what are you going to do for the primaries? And a lot of people who are, you know, leaning left want to vote in, in the more conservative primary, exactly for the reason you spell. In the end, I don't know how many people will eventually do it, but the, the desire to do it is very strong. And I think it's one of those issues about democracy. I'm quite convinced that starting to have primaries like we have in France. I mean, the Socialist Party started in 2007, had them again in, in 2012, and, and the, the Republicans, more conservative, are starting this year. It's, it's going to be a huge mess for all kinds of reasons, but it's not something you can turn your back into. Once you start saying, uh, you know, the people, the citizen should decide who is going to be candidate. You cannot go the next time and say, oh, well, we didn't exactly like what, we, what you voted, so no, not this year. And I am quite sure that starting primaries has a lot to do with this common global culture we all grew up with, and we've seen what's going on in the US forever, and primaries since the 1970s. And obviously, at some point, it seems like, why don't we do it also? Except that there are always a lot of perverted effects because, as you mentioned, the, the French election is in two rounds. There is not one general election. There is a first round with many candidates and then a second round with two candidates, which is pretty much primary and then general election. Having primaries in France means there are two rounds in each primary, so potentially if you're really devoted, you can vote four times, and then, you know, general election in two rows. So it's a huge, massive mess, if you want my, um, if you want my opinion. But it's true. I mean, we have two president, former president, Nicolas Sarkozy and, and François Hollande, who are so disliked and creates such massive rejection beyond the opposing camp, even within their own ranks. But it's very scary to have one of them in front of Marine Le Pen. I mean, Alain Juppé with 70 is not very exciting, but seems like a decent, intelligent, polite man. I mean, you know, our expectations are getting lower by the minute. 
seems like a protection against this big risk of having the extreme right winning. So I'll, I'll ask one more question and then go to the audience. Gordon, in our conversation about Brexit and the diagnosis of what happened there, Gordon Brown um, said that Brexit, or suggested that Brexit was a consequence of this backlash against globalization that we've already discussed. And he said a second, perhaps casualty, of this backlash against globalization is the demise of the two-party system, which may be something that we're seeing, or at least a threat to the two-party system that we're seeing in the United States. We haven't talked about the role of social media and non-party uh, methods of activating and organizing voters, which I think is clearly a part of what's happening in the United States. Do you have any comment on the threat to the traditional party system that we've just discussed? I guess the, uh, the institutional system in the United States so strongly pushes towards two-party system that what might happen, we never know. I mean, parties die uh, in history. We've seen it. You know, we're not sure the Republican Party as such is going to survive, but if it would break up, most probably there would be three major parties and then two. Like um, before the Civil War, you know, the Whigs were the strong party and, and they coexisted with the new Republicans for a while and eventually uh, they, they disappeared. So I, I guess we we'll, sooner or later we'll go back to two parties. But the role of the social media is, is something else entirely. And one of the issues this year is that uh, Donald Trump has proven extremely savvy as uh, manipulating, using in an extremely effective way the social media. I mean, it's scary in a way because it's so cheap. Uh, you know, the, the tweets, and it takes a half minute to, to, to write it and uh, one click to send it to his 15 million followers, apparently, and around the world. It costs nothing, no thinking as well, I mean, most of the time. But it's, I mean, for some, he's proven like using his, I think, his temperament. I mean, it's very instinctive the way he tweets at three or four o'clock in the morning, obviously, insomniac on his own, no kid around to tell him, no, don't do that, <laughs> postpone it till tomorrow. Um, but it's worked, and it, it's really worked. I mean, and it, 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 it buys into what you said, post-truth times. It doesn't matter. You don't. You can't prove or unprove anything in, within 40 signs, 140 signs. So just one strong view, one strong and very simplistic slogan. There's no time for nuance. You know, just what what Donald Trump is spreading those days that the. The electoral system is one big lie. Polls are not flawed. Polls are rigged. Elections will be rigged and stolen from us. That does it. But I'm quite convinced that in the coming elections, we'll have young volunteers and beyond volunteers in both campaigns that will be extremely efficient at using this kind of social media. And it's very hard to combine being efficient in this sort of environment, as well as making sense and having a decent respect for truth and, and, and facts. <laughs> Stick to Britain. Uh, I think that in Britain, more than the two-party system, what is at risk is single-party government. Uh, we already seen one case in which there was a coalition, the coalition between the Conservative Party and the Liberal. And coalition government might become more the rule in Britain than the exception with um, this uh, weakening of the major parties. Uh, because you know, the British system is with a single member, the combination of single member district and uh, plurality rule, like in the US, it represents a big obstacle, mid-sized parties. So I think it will not break down entirely the, the British system because of this combination. But as I said, the likelihood of uh, 
coalition government will increase, even though, I have to say this, very difficult to predict the future even, but if Gordon Brown were here, I would, I would ask him the thing, because he's from Scotland. You know, today, as things stand, the Conservative Party in Britain has a strong possibility, if, it, if they manage well the Brexit, the Conservative Party has a strong possibility to become the dominant party in British politics for many years. And this is due to two things. One is the rise and consolidation of the Scottish National Party in Scotland. The Labour Party has been kicked out of Scotland. In this place has been taken by the Scottish National Party. This has weakened the Labour Party structurally. This is a structural weakness, not just a cyclical thing. I don't think the Labour Party will be able to regain its position in Scotland. And the other thing that has weakened the Labour Party, opening the chance for long dominance of the Conservative Party, is Corbyn and his stand, too radical stand on, you know, social and economic issues, which is leaving an open field for the conservative, conservative in the middle of the political spectrum. But the question is, will the conservative manage well Brexit? If they do, they'll become the dominant party. So instead of, so what I'm saying, two things I tell you. There's one chance for coalition, more coalition governments, but the other outcome could be a long dominance of the Conservative Party in British politics. I don't know what's going to happen. Both outcomes could materialize. So with that, let's go to you. I'm sure you have questions, comments. Could you identify yourselves? Uh, I'm uh, British, married to an Italian, and I shall soon be seeking asylum probably in Italy <laughs> I don't know, after Brexit. Uh, the first comment is that you know, the rise of populist parties in every European country, and now in America as well perhaps, you know, why are they appealing to the people? I mean, I never understand why the, the major parties do not listen to what the people want. And we've been talking about mass immigration, unemployment, etc. cetera. The, the major parties seem to be totally oblivious to you know, the plight of the people looking after the country and the people. And that is why the populist parties are gaining ground. I mean, Sarkozy has tried to sort of take over some of the politics of uh, Le Pen, but uh, in France, by wanting less immigration, more security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the world is, is really in a dangerous situation. But coming back to you know, the main point of America, uh, I looked at a, a map recently in a newspaper, and you have the East Coast blue, the West Coast blue, and in the middle it's red. Now, I'm not an expert in American politics, but in England, for example, you have swings. You know, the election results up until the last few years have always been decided by a few people switching votes in a constituency, and because it's first past the post, you know, it changes the, you know, Labour came in or then the Conservative Party came in. I was actually a member of the Liberal Party and the Lib Dems for a long time, and the coalition, which was uh, a choice of uh, Clegg, has completely wiped out the Liberal Party. So it shows where, you know, the mistake that can be done. And you've got the case of Spain, which is in total chaos because you've got lots of parties, and Italy is as well up until recently. You know, has always had too many parties which have never been able to govern. But in America, uh, do you think that, I mean, I've always been a, a Democrat. I'm a member in France of Democrats abroad. You know, I would vote Democrat. I wouldn't vote Republican. Now, do you think that in America, you know, again, you've got a short, smaller number of people that might swing from one party to the other? Are they really, you know, the southern states perhaps would all, you know, vote for Trump, the Republican candidate, regardless of who he is? I mean, do you think that there's going to be a lot of swings that people might switch parties? Or would they stay with their own party? I'll say a, a few words about France, about why well, the traditional parties don't give answers, appropriate answers to what the people want. And if you consider issues like immigration and unemployment in, in particular, um, one of the things I, I would say is that 
what the people want is often very contradictory. We have seen examples, for instance, in, uh, in California, where direct um, democracy is quite developed with all the referendums. And we had votes in quick succession of people asking for this and that reform, and then in the next vote, blocking any kind of budget for the same reforms. So, yeah, people wanted certain reforms, but then they didn't want more taxes. And so, you know, it's not, people isn't always wise. And in France, for instance, uh, there is anger about immigration, anger about jobs. But when this government and the previous one tried to instill just a dash of free economy within our system, uh, you have trade unions that block every single reform that could truly create jobs. And, and trade unions aren't interested in creating jobs, they're interested in keeping their, their constituencies and you, you know, having their, uh, their, their influence and the money that comes with it. And they don't want to let anybody in that's outside of the, job, of, uh, of the employment. They, you know, you're out, you're out. But people that we protect, they are very well protected. So people have a, every right to be angry about a bunch of things, but they don't offer proper solutions. And I think that is when we need candidates and elected officials that are able to be real teachers to explain the issues. And I, I'll give you, and I, I, I'll finish with that, but I'll give you one example about Sarkozy's campaign which I find those days truly appalling. And, and I've, I know him and I've met him, we're not close, but I know he's very bright and he could do something else. But he does think, he's very convinced that this is how you get the votes and you have to get your hands dirty and talk this language of excluding all kinds of categories of a population because otherwise it's going to be the extreme right. And I, I disagree with that. I think of Barack Obama in, in, in 28. I mean, it was not like it was an easy situation. It, I mean, there was a massive economic crisis, worse since uh, 1929. And he um, ran a campaign that lifted people beyond their everyday feelings and capabilities. And it was all about you know, being smarter and kinder and understanding better. And I'm not putting a judgment on what he did or did not, but the campaign as such went way beyond the absolute dead, decided democratic voters. He went obviously way beyond because he appealed to the better side of people. I mean, there is a better side. We are not all mean and, 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 and hateful. And as, that brings us to the independent voters who are undecided. I think this year they're undecided a lot because they're uh, you know, dissatisfied with the choice they have. And I'm, I'm talking uh, Trump, Clinton. But common wisdom those days is that there is one third of real Democrats, one third of real Republicans, and more or less one third of independents. But I know for a fact, and by name sometimes, quite a few Republicans who are going to vote for Hillary Clinton. So there is a crossover as well. Poll from two days ago has 84% of Democrats, this is to your question of crossover voting, 84% of Democrats voting for Clinton, 83% of Republicans voting for Trump, and independents slightly favoring Hillary by 4134. So it's pretty much not crossing over. But I don't know how real this poll is. <laughs> I know how real the poll is. I don't know how accurate it is. Carol, could you identify yourself? I'm Carol Biagiotti. Uh, I think there are a number of people who are not saying that they're going to vote for Trump, but they will. I mentioned that to Steve couple of weeks ago, and I don't think they're taking that into, con into consideration. What do you think? Yeah, and in France, I mean, that's why we had a lot of trouble with polls. Uh, telling that you vote for the National Front used to be like socially unacceptable, so people wouldn't tell. Now it's very relaxed. People do tell, and, and polls are more accurate. And I'm not sure that voting for Trump has become socially acceptable in a lot of circles. So maybe the polls are wrong. 
maybe. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm quite sure quite a few people would not tell they vote for Trump, which is pretty scary. <laughs> My name's Andrea Davis. There have been a lot of phenomena recently that are just heartbreaking to watch from overseas as to what's happening with these elections. And a couple of them, of course, we've spoken of just the general baseness of political discourse in general. The fact that we have political leaders tweeting messages that are contained in a slogan instead of the grand discourses that we were used to hearing and that can serve as models for young people looking up to political leaders and wanting them to get involved in the political system. I think that one of the sad after effects of uh, a type of even language that excludes the words fair play and a concept of ethics in political discourse, the way that the politicians themselves speak to the public and speak between each others, is a way of disenfranchising uh, young people making them think, I don't want to have anything to do with this kind of system. I have my values, I will go on, but I'll go outside of the political system. I'll do volunteer work on my own, but I have no intention of joining a political party and, and becoming part of that. That is sad. The concept to me of the politicization of the Supreme Court is heartbreaking. What is happening and I'm a lawyer and I've always been raised with a great belief in, in the objectivity of the Supreme Court. All right, and that, this is you have to, and in the rule of law, and that uh, once you are a judge, you, uh, you look and you're looking at precedent, you're looking at concept, you're looking at constitutional principle. What's happening now, and what at least for me, I'm hearing for the first time, is a discussion of hold your nose and vote for Trump because otherwise Hillary will be able to select candidates for the Supreme Court. And we don't want these candidates who will then vote for the left, or they'll vote against abortion, or they'll vote this way, or they'll vote that other way. This type of drawing the, the, the Supreme Court into this type of radicalization of a political discourse is disturbing to me. And the other thing that really bothers me is, I guess I'm getting old, but I sort of grew up in a time where the first thing that any elected politician said right after they were elected is, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, but I've just been elected. I'm now your senator. I am now the congressman, the congresswoman from the state of Massachusetts. I grew up in a time where I'm from Boston, so I'm from the state of Massachusetts, where we had a great liberal tradition with Senator Ted Kennedy, who would go out to lunch with some of the most conservative Republicans that have a great lunch, that smoke a cigar, and then they'd sit down and they'd say, what's for the good of the country? How can we negotiate? How can we find a compromise? And what we've seen over the past, I would say, really during both terms of Obama, the past eight years, a rise on the one hand of a radical left and on the other hand of the Tea Party that are forcing both parties into positions that I always used to criticize Italy for. We had people with tears in their eyes saying, oh, I believe that this legislation is good, but I can't vote for it because I'm from the Five Star Party or I'm from this party and I can't vote because I'm the opposition and my role is just to say no. And I would always say, we don't do that in the United States. Once you're elected, you try to work for something for the good of the public. And it's sort of... Uh, something that I think is going to need to be fixed by, I, hopefully, by President Clinton when she's elected, uh, is this concept that there is compromise, there is, uh, there, that you do not just vote because you are of a particular political party, but you do try to negotiate, reach compromise for the good of the country and uh, for everybody. Well, then I hope you'll join me in thanking our two wonderful political analysts.